Kuzum Suishmir, and welcome to Shift F1, a podcast about speedy race cars. That, by the way, is an Azerbaijani phrase uh, for, or I, I suppose, Azerbaijani Arabic, um, for, uh, my eyes don't drink water from you. Whoa, that's a lot to unpack. That sounds like an Enya song. Yes, it's, uh, it, it's meant to uh, mean that something is suspicious. Uh, there's something very suspicious about the whole setup of the Azerbaijan weekend, which we will get to in this episode. Uh, I am Drew Scanlon. Joining me, Danny O'Dwyer. How are you, Danny? Welcome back. Thanks. I'm, I'm all right. I'm actually kind of sad I'm on the podcast this week because last week I got to listen to the podcast, which was actually ah. a lot of fun. Um, uh, no racing around the world. I was disappointed and nobody took up the mantle on that. No Neum. Although I, I suppose I can see it as a sort of uh, an appreciation of my what I bring to this podcast uh, by letting me have those. Well, what I bring to this podcast is uh, catchphrases every 40 minutes. Uh, also joining us, Rob Zachney. How are you, Rob? Not too bad. Still trying to wrap my brain around the new weekend format. <laughs> yes. Uh, that's spoilers. That's what I was referring to with my phrase. By the way, I'm sorry. Not Arabic. Turkish. Turkish. I believe that is Turkish. I'm reading from a Reddit post here, so apologies if I said something heinous. All of our Azerbaijani um, listeners, um, if you are in <laughs> Azerbaijan, let us know. Podca- we, we probably have, have We actually one. did. I remember we did have emails yeah. from Azerbaijan. People went to the last Baku, or Baku a few years back, so I take it back. I take it back who? Oh, wow. You a saw that back who? You're taking it back who? <laughs> uh, if you're new to this podcast, a very warm welcome to you, and if you are new to Formula One itself, we recommend listening to our preseason primer episode, which assumes no prior F1 knowledge and explains how the, sport, how the sport works and who everybody is. So if you'd like to go back and listen to that, it's episode 216. Also, this show is supported entirely by our audience over at patreon.com slash shift F1, where every month we release bonus podcasts and videos exclusively for our patrons that cover racing documentaries and films, F1 video games, experiments with other racing series, and a lot of weird things. So if you would like to support the show and get access to all that fun stuff, Head over to patreon.com slash shift F1 or click the link in the show notes. So what do we have going on this month, Danny? Yeah, that IndyCar primer. Um, people still enjoying that one. Uh, I, there's been a lot of IndyCar this month as well. So really, if, oh, yeah. if, if, and it's good stuff. So if you are, if that is the barrier, then, the, you know, we have the, we have the solution for you. Um, I'm not sure. Have we decided what we're doing next month yet? I don't think it's come up yet. We haven't. We haven't. I wonder if it's another, I'm enjoying these primers. All right. Um, Something esoteric would be fun. Maybe some more movie goodness. If you have any suggestions, put them in the comments on our YouTube video or hit, up, hit us up on Patreon as well, of course. Uh, massive shout out there to all of our incredible title sponsors. Uh, Toby Montana. This next person, am I just meant to say their name? I forgot. I, I said the whole thing last time. You did? Okay. Cyphus Training hyphen Turf SCX in parentheses Joe M. <laughs> Alex Medina, Kikaha of the Art, at Team Blackjack, Michael Maves, Gordy's Army, at Talking Autos, Olivia Evans, Ironstation.dev, TelemetryDeck.com, David Mule, Drew Stewart, Bailey Foot, sorry, Drew Stewart, Bailey Foot, Abdullah Althani, Jason Chadwick, Abraham Getchell, hashtag Bunny Crimes, Sniggs, Alex Goucher, Max Voltar, Circuit Demon, Troy Stammer, Humberto Roca, William Romph, Irvine Clinical Research, Lachlan the Maddened Man, and Jason Kelly, back in the order they're meant to be, that alphabetical <laughs> stuff, I, I, I thought I was having a stroke, I was, dri- I was driving up Highway 101, <laughs> and you, it was like hearing my, hearing my, my family uh, said to me with different names or something it was so confusing um not to lambast you for doing all the extra work you had to do because listen I, that's what happens when yeah. you leave me alone to my own devices Danny. <laughs> uh all right well thank you uh to all of our patrons um let's get to the news there is some here uh starting with a couple of uh deep in the weeds formula one stuff uh rob yeah so uh there was a meeting of the World Motorsports Council this week, which is a like sporting rules and regulations body uh, that meets intermittently. And they nominally govern F1 ultimately, but really they take the recommendations of uh, F1 stakeholders. Pretty mm-hmm. like they're, they're led by that. So it's not like uh, the council, a, a third party is really coming up with rules and regs for F1. It's, it's more that they are... Uh, confirming things that F1's already uh, agreed among themselves. One of the things that uh, everyone agreed to for this year only, which I find interesting and a bit odd, 
is that they are uh, giving teams more uh, power unit components for this season. Their allotment is going from three to four of uh, the internal combustion engine, the turbo, and the two uh, MGUs, uh, the the uh, thermal and uh, kinetic. Uh, so uh, that like this year they're they're going to get to use uh, a, a fourth of those parts before they start assessing penalties. And it seems like part of the agreement is driven by the fact that the teams have been arguing there's more wear and tear on the cars with the expanded schedule and the expanded sprint schedule right. as well. And, uh, it, you know, in, in addition, obviously, there, there's already there's always a shocking amount of attrition uh, by this year. But it, the fact that they didn't go open ended uh, suggests that, you know, there's real pressure to to try and adhere to this limit uh, rather than soften the limit uh in light of the fact that f1's gonna have long seasons for the foreseeable future uh this right. is you know this has been a fact of life in the sport for a while uh and you might look at this i certainly i thought for a moment that they were that this might herald that they're going to relent and maybe make compliance with the motor gen- generator the uh the power unit allotments a little easier moving forward but it really is just a one-off uh we'll see if they do another one-off next year but uh, th- this is this is sort of exigent circumstances. Interesting yeah, I mean, well, to I see mean, them doing it this early, isn't it? But this yeah, early or this late? I guess it's it doesn't seem like we've had like a. Was this something that they didn't decide that they were doing prior to the season? Like presumably these rules were assumed or thought of at some stage prior to the season. It just seems funny that it's not it's not as if we've had. I was just trying to figure out if we've had a lot of power unit failures or component failures. It's not like there's been that much in the first four races. No, it looks like this sort of this started to brew up uh, like in the last month. So this wasn't a thing that they were just like that that they've been discussing before the season. It seems like it was a, uh, it seems like it was a thing that came together as the as the season got rolling. Um, I actually have found the uh, status as of the. Oh no, that's actually a little bit too earlier. I think I'm not sure if that's true. Did Lando this has got to be like yeah. mostly about the sprint races, right? Like yeah. I think we we have been doing them for a couple of years, but I feel like they haven't really committed. Formula One hasn't really committed to like this is what we're doing now uh, until maybe now. Um, yeah. Or or maybe not even now because if this is if this is just like a, a you know a one off. Um, I yeah I don't know. It makes sense but, on paper. Like when whenever we talk about the amount of engines they have and the amount of races, it always did feel a bit tight. You know, it felt like, ooh, like okay, let's see. In my head, I wouldn't have been surprised if halfway through the season they amended this. Maybe they have to amend it now so that they have time. Like maybe it's a thing you can't do in the summer break because there's simply not enough time for, to make the components. I'm not. I'm not sure, but yeah. Nothing about this seems particularly strange, though. It does seem like they're doing a lot of races, and as you said, Drew, with the, you know, the increased stress we're going to see, you know, especially sprint races in places like Baku. You know what I mean? Like that's a, <laughs> yeah. There's not much room for error places here, and you can really damage parts. Like wear and tear is one thing, but also you know, totaling it. I know it tends not to happen maybe to the internal combustion engine, but you know, d- those shunts do have their do have negative effects on all the components in there, even if they're not absolutely banjaxed by the incident themselves. Well, speaking of sprint races and Baku, Rob, oh what is in store for us this What's weekend? What's happening? I'm confused. Yeah, so I think we've discussed this before, but this is the clearest that it's been laid out and it's been voted on, and this is going to govern, govern the sprint weekends moving forward uh, for, the, for, for this year. So... You know, if you if you're still in your head thinking the sprint has anything to do with the race grid, those days are done. We're not <laughs> doing sprint qualifying. It's a sprint. It's like has nothing to do with the race grid. Then why are we doing a sprint? Uh because we need asses Cha-ching. and seats on Saturday. Cha-ching. That is Cha-ching. Yeah, that that is that is that is really what this is about. So the new weekend structure that is going to accompany every sprint weekend. On Friday, Free practice one as usual, and then we are off the rails. Free practice one. <laughs> hope you enjoyed free practice can, because can I, we are going straight into race grid qualifying. Can I just can I make a suggestion? Yeah, they just call. They should just call it free practice. That's a good point because there ain't there ain't two. <laughs> nope. <laughs> 
Sure ain't three. Uh, so yeah, so they go from free practice one into qualifying for the Grand Prix. Right. Then on Saturday, they have sprint qualifying. Qualifying which is now for the qualifying sprint. for the sprint. Okay. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. So you're so uh, <laughs> it's going to be a little shorter. Uh, sprint qualifying one is going to be twelve minutes. Sprint oh. qualifying two is going to be ten. Oh my! Sprint qualifying is going to be three. SQ one. Uh, so, sorry. Uh, Wait, yeah. SQ and SQ three is going to be eight minutes. Yeah, right. Okay. SQ three. Great. We've another acronym yeah. or uh, italicism <laughs> in here for. <laughs> and add, then add, add it to, we have to patch this the uh, the primer the primer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then that afternoon, we have the sprint race. Okay. Amazing. So, so Saturday sort of exists in its own bubble. Like yes. the race weekend is is Friday and Sunday, and then Saturday is just sprint day. <laughs> and then Sunday is uh, the Grand Prix. Uh, so there's a couple other details here uh, that they're gonna come up. So we'll just we, we will just deal with this. Okay. okay. Uh, we you know honestly I should probably bookmark uh, the, these notes for later in the season because I bet you it's gonna keep coming up uh, as as weird things continue to unfold. Do we do okay, we want to so, react to this first, or do you want to get through the the, the nitty gritty? Let's get through the nitty gritty because okay. I think we can just take it as a whole. All righty. Uh, so the teams are going to have to save uh, three sets of tires for the uh, sprint qualifying sessions. The mediums, whatever they are, are going to be mandatory for sprint qualifying one and two, and then they go to softs four three. Huh. Now, how are they? How are penalties going to work? For this thing, oh, because yeah. now we have two races, right? So, <laughs> a grid penalty incurred in practice one, uh, Danny, I think you're right, in practice, <laughs> a gr- grid penalty incurred in practice or qualifying, the Friday qualifying, will apply to the race. A grid penalty incurred in the shootout, I guess that's what they're saying, it's shootout qualifying. Uh, yeah, grid that's the sprint in- qualifying. On the official yeah. F1 site, it says, <laughs> it says practice one, Qualifying sprint shootout sprint race. I hate this. Uh, sorry, <laughs> not to not to uh, like foreshadow my reaction. <laughs> right. no, it's, uh, just, it's wonderful to once again feel like you've just stepped into F one. It's great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a grid. So grid penalty in the shootout. That's going to be assessed in the sprint. Okay. Grid penalty incurred in the sprint. There's nowhere else for it to go. It's got to go to the race. Okay. Breach of park for May uh, gives you a pit lane start for sprint and 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 the race and the race. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not entirely sure how this is going to work in practice. Power unit penalties will only apply to the race. I guess that does make sense. So, like, I suppose if you change to a new power unit and you get a penalty, they're still going to let you sprint, and then you you assess the full penalty. For the race play, for the race, the race starting position. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, Sprint's worth fewer so, points. Yeah, the points allocation. This is the same. Uh, so this is um, P one through P eight. It is eight points for first, and then seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. That's it. Okay, okay. that's a lot. And, I'm interested in the last sorry, one here. On. Uh, did you say this? The gearbox and power unit penalties incurred over the weekend will be saved for the Grand Prix. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the, I'm interested, first of all, in the tire situation. So mediums are mandatory. It does say mediums. So they will be able to change their tires to put on. It's not like they have one set for SQ1 <laughs> through SQ3. Well, it's three sets across three sessions. Medium right. and only, mandatory, but it's and two soft. of those have to use mediums. So I guess you could use two sets in one yeah, session. Yeah, and then you're running scrubbed tires for the next one. Yeah, yeah. Advance, that is maybe? interesting, though, right? Because with two sets of qualifying, it definitely does. It'll be interesting to see if people do run two sets in SQ1, or whether or not there'll be some d- degree of you know trying to save tires for the weekend in that. But so <clears throat> I'm not sure. I'm not clear on whether these tires are released back into the the race pool. Oh, they My have to be. My suspicition would be they're not. You think they're yeah. they're only for the sprint then? Yeah. 
that would be my suspicion. Yeah, so there's no there's no incentive to to save your tires because yeah. it, it's it. and again this has no bearing on the race. It, it's done in its own little world, so may as well go all out and try to get those. Gotcha. Do, those do very we, few points. Do we know how long the sprint is? How many laps? Uh, it's usually well. It has been one third race distance. Yeah. Okay. So if that's with the no case, pit stops. Right. Yeah. With no pits. So we're talking like forty minutes or something. Man. Real Moto okay. GP race. Yeah, in Baku. God, what a in nightmare Baku. of a play. It seems like. Do we think people are going to be more or less? Uh, risk averse. In a way, I can see them being more risk averse because it's not like they're fighting for the for pole position. You know, like now they're right. just it's, fighting for the points. It's points. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess eight points is, you know, eight points is a lot of points. Why would you start this race if you're in 18th? Because the FIA makes you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that's a big one. Yeah. Uh, although good, maybe, good maybe, like, no, this isn't going to happen. <laughs> it isn't like because the people toward the mid pack and toward the back are going to be like, I have nothing to lose ready to die, uh, <laughs> that they will charge to the front. And like everyone with something to live for on Sunday is going to back off. That's not going to happen. This is still going to be like, and there goes max. Cause again, the safest place to be will be driving into the distance anyway. Right. Yeah. Uh, so I don't like, look, is this going to be better than, fr- would I take this over, two more free practices yes so i'm in even if the format doesn't fully work or naturally fit or or seem to really make all that much sense I'm, i'll take it i'll take no. it over practice it's in like practice sucks i like watching it but it sucks <laughs> yeah i don't watch it really like it's gotta, i gotta be really thirsting for f1 uh for me to watch practice like every year i'm like the first race of the year I'm like, hell yeah, I'm watching practice. And then two weeks later, I'm like, I'm, I ain't watching that ever. But I, I don't know. It's like, here's here's my problem. Uh, so the sprint race, I like, I like when things have a coherent concept, right? I like when yeah. there's some sort of a logic to them. And the logic of the sprint race was, hey, we think we can make qualifying more engaging. That we think we can create more race, meaningful race action over the weekend. And maybe have something that generates uh, some surprises both in the race grid and also, uh, you know, via the sprint itself. The way, the way the incentives are going to work out. Now, the sprint is hermetically sealed inside <laughs> itself, right? It is all on Saturday for a small amount of points with no bearing on the Grand Prix qualifying that was decided the day before. So now we just have a sprint. Yes, and this does mean you can ignore it. Oh, you can just not watch it at all. Yeah, because you were kind of forced to watch the sprint beforehand because it was like qualifying too. So there's just enough points to play. Eight points is not, you know, you look how fast, how much they fight for that, uh, for that extra, the fastest lap point. Yeah. And then you look at this. Drivers love points. Here's here's another like hypothetical thing, which may or may not be uh, relevant. How many times have you watched qualify? Well, obviously practice. I was going to say obviously for Rob, it sounds like not not that many outside the opening races. But you know when that thing happens uh, where Red Bull have a a, a tough Friday and it, they can't really seem to dial it in, and then on Saturday they kind of do, and then by Sunday they're all right. By qualifying, they've sort of like nailed this it. This is Domenicali's argument. This is going to give them so little runway to fix problems with the cars that they're just going to have to fix it. You know, drive. They're going to have to race faster and quicker, early, so earlier rather. This has been yes. Uh, Stefan, uh, Stefano Domenicali made this argument that like the teams are so good at setting up the car, and you give them three practice sessions, they are going to refine that down uh pretty well and that probably that probably accounts for some of our almost like uh programmatic grid formations Mm. right where it's like everyone in their in their proper place based on the relative strengths of the team this does create a bit of a chaotic element where if you didn't if you were in the weeds and free practice one you didn't solve the problem then 
you might be in you might be out of grid position uh, come the race, and the sprint qualifying isn't going to iron that bit of friction out, which I can kind of get behind, but also I'm a little bit I am just a little bit leery of is this is this going to be quality or is it going to be quantity? And mm-hmm. I think there's a bit of a danger when you got uh, a long season and now you're filtering in more of these sprint races that you're watering the soup. And yeah. just across the Grand Prix calendar, the F1 calendar, there's already a fair amount of water in that soup <laughs> uh, with, with, with some of the some of these races and and the the action we tend to get. And so I'm I'm a little bit I'm I'm a little bit skeptical of this concept of like. Why are we really doing this? I understand why the promoters, why the people holding the Grand Prix want it. But I love racing. I can't get enough racing. I am not sure I need F1 sprints. Yeah. I, I Where I fall on this is if they're going to keep doing sprints, I would rather they do them this way, where they are compartmentalized from qualifying, re- regular qualifying and regular race. Um I I didn't, you know, I I got to thinking that the sprint and the race were one big race, you know, separated by a red flag. And it just, I don't know, that never felt clean to me. I didn't, I didn't really like it. Um, This is much cleaner to me. I do wish, though, that it was an actual shootout. Like, I think Formula E does or did where it's one lap of qualifying. And then that is your qualifying time. Yeah, I, I think agree. this shortened qualifying. I'm well, curious to see how it plays out, but it's not going to scramble things as much. I would love shootout fast lap qualifying too, because the, a thing I could do with never discussing again is traffic on a qualifying yep. lap. Yeah, yeah. Like I am so like it is. There is nothing engaging about whatsoever. Like who? Like I'm so tired of going to replays. You know, uh, wow. I guess he just didn't see him there. Uh, he might get a penalty for interfering with that with that fast lap. I don't care. I don't care. Nobody can see anything. And yep. the, the, there's not enough like real estate on the track and the sessions are not long <laughs> enough to give people a clear shot. Yep. Agreed. All right. Well, from weird weekends to people being weird, Danny, what people, are people out there doing? People are being weird, Drew. I don't know if you know about people, but they're weird. And sometimes yeah. they do things that are so weird that people write news articles about them. And then we get to talk about them here. Um, I have two stories here that are about uh, uh, retire or, or elder, uh, what do we say, veteran, let's say. That's a kind word. Here veteran F1 drivers. And I actually have a secret third one I'm going to throw in. That oh, good. I just, I just remembered that I want to bring up uh, at the end, uh, just as a little bit of a chaser. Uh, the first one is uh, regarding um, the, the iconic Michael Schumacher. Obviously, there was... People will probably have come across. There was a, a, a weird story last week where a German magazine said that they were doing the first ever interview with Michael Schumacher since his uh, accident over 10 years ago now. If you don't know, uh, Michael Schumacher is a one of the most iconic drivers in the sport. He retired for the second time from the sport in 2012. Um, and soon after, on a, a skiing trip with his family, he uh, unfortunately had a, a tragic accident, which left him in what we are widely sort of understood to be some sort of a... Um, a vegetative state or, or or debilitated state, I think maybe is a better way to say it. We don't know. The family has asked for privacy and largely the F1 world has given them that. Um, there's a documentary actually out about his legacy, which we we did a patron podcast on it, didn't yes. we? I think we did. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. very, very good. And it, I think, tastefully handles the issue of, you know you know how he is uh, he his wife said he is with them but he is different so i think we can all sort of read between the lines there um obviously the distasteful uh, german um magazine folks who got a whiff of that ai malarkey decided that it wasn't uh, they did not want to be tasteful and they basically created a interview by pumping a bunch of schumacher quotes into an ai and having it spit out answers um perhaps Uh, To the shock of absolutely no one, the editor of that magazine was swiftly fired. Um, The article was pulled from the online sources. Um, But it has since come to bear that uh, I think The Athletic found out that the uh, Schumacher family are going to be taking legal action with regards to this story. I don't think anyone would blame them for it. Um, I think it's going to be perhaps a landmark uh, trial as it pertains to 
don't touch the Schumacher family, but also perhaps in terms of wh- where we are when it comes to uh, AI you know, being used to posthumously give quotes to people. Obviously, it won't create precedent wherever it's happening if this is a civil action but um, uh, or a private uh, uh, issue. But, um, you know, you can you can see if 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 they were to, I don't know, win a case in this regard, then it perhaps scares other uh, uh, so-called journalists in this case from doing or publications rather uh, from from doing uh, this type of reporting. I'm so curious. We have German listeners. Uh, is yeah. the Actuel like? Is it like Us Weekly or is it like Weekly World News? Yes. Right. Like there's there's flavors of weekly tabloids that we have. Some are just like celebrity news, and they can be a little bit like uh, scummy in terms of like the way they cover uh, certain stories. But then there is the whole like uh, aliens introduce yes. aliens <laughs> took me on a date with Elvis, <laughs> right. and it's like that. That's the caliber of like just weirdo shit that you're you're reading. I'm curious, like. You know, is where where on that spectrum does does the actual uh, like fall? But the the thing in the the athletic piece by by Luke Smith, who uh, I think formerly of Autosport, uh, right? The fact that they did it as like a a little <laughs> impish reveal, where at the end they're like, you know, obviously this wasn't really talking to Michael Schumacher; it was via AI. Uh, that is like. What are you doing? I thought the concept was bad before, but right. like being cute about it, especially yeah. when someone is, yeah, like probably pretty substantially disabled, uh, you know, especially when it comes to language and motor functions, uh, to sort of be like, are we really talking to Michael Schumacher? No, you're not. <laughs> it's it's uh, incredibly poor taste to even like flirt with the idea poor that you taste. are, and perhaps on, it seems doubly so considering I'm sure the German media are more than aware of this more than any other. You know what I mean? It seems I was shocked to hear that. Uh, I, I remember I read an article about it last week when the editor was fired, and I believe she might have been editor of the it seemed like she was the editor for a long time like since like 2004 or something and that made me think oh is this a rag like is this like yeah well because the other detail in the athletic piece was in 20 like to quote the piece in 2014 the magazine ran a picture of schumacher and his wife karina on the cover with the headline awake only for the piece to discuss cases of patients waking up from coma and not related to schumacher yeah yeah, so maybe they stepped over there already too far past the real line line. Um, speaking of legal action, uh, our good friend Felipe Massa, we talked about this, I think it was two weeks ago. I think I was on that podcast. Um, we talked about the, if Crashgate didn't happen, did I win the championship? Revel- uh, he just woke up 3 a.m. <laughs> 3 a.m. one morning. Wait a second. <laughs> Felipe Massa just sits straight up in bed. <laughs> And put- <laughs> well, hang on. In fairness, in fairness, what caused him to sit bolt up right awake at three in the morning yes. was Bernie Ecclestone confessing, oh, yeah, we knew from the jump yeah. that Crashgate had happened. But for the good of the sport, we just didn't, like, disqualify the event. Yeah, Bernie Eccleston had a sort of a, a an imaginary, what is this, when something like uh, the, 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 like, too much time has passed for you to, like, put somebody in jail statute of limitations the statute of limitations on Crashgate he thought it had run up Um, obviously not for Felipe Massa Um, so apparently according to Autosport uh, Autosport has learned that Massa has pulled together a team of lawyers to evaluate the situation and work out definitively if there are any grounds to take the matter further Uh, continuing to quote uh, Autosport here uh, one of their first actions, however, has been to ensure that from now on the situation will be dealt uh, with quietly behind closed doors, which means no more pl- public statements from Massa over the latest steps. Um, according to Autosport as well, while in theory Massa could seek out the views of the Court of Arbitrations for Sport, it has no jurisdiction over the FIA on issues uh, like this. Uh, the problem being that there is a statute within um, Formula One that basically has it we've talked about it before basically states that the results cannot be adjudicated over once they are finalized um be which that, takes um, yeah which there is a grace period but it's like what a week right yes it's short yeah. it's it's yeah. it like precludes 
it very much is a uh, almost like a finders keepers rule, <laughs> right? Where where it is, you know, if you didn't discover the huge scandal uh, in the in in the grace period, then uh, too bad. But I, and I think you know, Masa's position is that yeah, that you can't you can't uh, insulate yourself from a cover up. Just because that exists, right? I think that's that seems yeah. to be the the case that they're going to be making is like like whatever that that rule is obviously is not meant to apply to cases like this. Mm. Yeah, I, I don't think he expects the trophy to be taken from Lewis Hamilton and given given to him. I do think he is exploring whether Bernie Eccleston might owe him some money. Well, because that's right. Because that's the thing. Like, I think you make a very good case that um, I would bet you that you could actually come up with. Because you have you have instances to draw from. Like, uh, what is the what is the market? What what? How does the market value of an F one driver change if they win a championship? How uh-huh. long? Uh, what is their career longevity relative to that? Because remember, it was in no time at all that Alonso was a Ferrari and Massa's you know time was swiftly coming to an end. Uh, and what about emotional sport? distress? That was very distressing. Right. Have I've seen those highlights? Yeah. So I, I, I think this is a thing where like certainly with the lost income and uh yeah, some of the some of the distress, uh like you, you could come up with a number that Bernie, you owe me. Yeah. Uh because you because you and your pal like decided to look the other way is, on this. Is it corruption? If if they're not benefiting monetarily, well, I guess maybe indirectly they are by protecting the sport. But is yeah. there something to be said about them not letting? You know, I don't. I don't. I, that seems deep in legal weeds. Maybe that's yeah. why he's brought together a team. But yeah, it did seem a bit weird that Bernie Eccleston just came out with that. I feel like it feels like he's kind of like so old. A bit of he an does not care. That's true. That's true. I mean, but the thing is, I don't think it's just the the old thing. Like. He loves saying provocative shit. He li- he also lives that. That's true. for making yeah. these headlines. He's like a this is yeah. this is a dude who's like. And let me tell you about some other fascists I really admire. <laughs> and everyone's like, yeah, there, there goes Bernie, uh, a, a walking embarrassment, and he oh, doesn't Bernie. care. Oh Bernie! Yeah, exactly. And so, <laughs> you know, he has a ton of money. Even if even if Felipe somehow like found a legal way to like sue his ass off and like get a good portion of that money it won't one he'll be dead soon he knows that two he's like it still will not make him a not comically wealthy person and yeah. so i i think to a degree it's one of those things where for him i imagine this was such a great story i can't believe i haven't gotten to tell people about the time that me and max remember max uh me and me me and max decided to like cover up crash gate so the season could just keep rolling and we totally host felipe massa amazing lol uh danny uh, secret third story yeah my secret third story okay everyone put down your drinks just i don't know if you've had the same twitter experience as me for the past uh week but this is a story that my tw- twitter will just not let me put down regardless of how ridiculous it sounds oh boy is Fernando Alonso dating Taylor Swift? Oh my God! <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, I've I've heard about this too. I've what? heard about this. This is such this is such a weird thing. Yeah, so I have been like <laughs> I'm under an avalanche of the, this news story just keeps <laughs> getting sent to me because it's like it's right there. Like I've I I my wife loves Taylor Swift. I've listened. To, I've seen Taylor Swift twice in concert. Once Drew with you. Yeah, that's right. At the, at the Austin Grand of the Grand Americas. Uh, and there was a story going around, which I think originated in a Spanish tabloid, um, uh, about uh, some random tip that Fernando Alonso was dating Taylor Swift. Which I can't tell if this is a, a heist joke or if this is an age. I don't know what it. Is. It just seems ridiculous that these people would have be in the same circles whatsoever and obviously this kind of went around it became a bit of a, like a joke story that was going around um for a while and then i think it was yesterday <laughs> fernando alonso on tiktok um uh is he's he, he's like playing a taylor swift song in the background of him like waiting to get ready for baku so oh boy. he's yeah but he's like 
you know, pouring fuel on the on the ridiculous yeah. story, I think. Um, yeah. There was also a great quote. Did you see the interview of Bubba Wallace after the race uh, no. on the weekend? So some random fan or journalist, I don't know, said to him, um, oh, did you hear about Fernando and Taylor Swift? And he's like, what? <laughs> Bubba Wallace is like looking around like, there's no way this is true, right? And then she's like, yeah, apparently the internet's all over it. And he's like, man, good for him. Good for her. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, it's probably not true, but um, it's a great story, and I hope the the meme memeness of it rolls on a little bit longer. I'm surprised that you haven't. Had, you obviously don't spend as much on trash social social media as myself and Rob Drew. I, I certainly don't. Um, had not heard that. Uh, I'm very happy for them. <laughs> so, like the there's a hor- This makes such horrible sense, though, right? Because like. Fernando Alonso is basically a character in a Taylor Swift song. <laughs> like this is yes, just like yes, you're right. wrist for the yeah. for the artist mill. Uh, absolute. Like I don't know if she is dating Fernando Alonso, but she should date Fernando Alonso. It's great material. And break up with him. It's a great material. And yeah, like just a, oh, another, the album another we would banger get. of an album. It yeah, would, uh, yeah, it's yeah. gonna go out there. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, like it is. It, like it is. And hilar- it is an hilarious story for for sure. Uh, I like. I don't believe it, but at the same time, <laughs> it would be an incredible plot twist to all this. It would be amazing. Yes. I wouldn't know. I, w- I I would not know. I would. I would. He's you know, a bit you, of a mastermind. You think you know so- exactly. He's like. Then he's just. I don't know. He's he's continuing to be more and more interesting. You know, like you. Uh, you know, we we talked about Schumacher having a second retirement. Like most drivers later in their career have a sort of a they've passed their peak and you know they, they sort of slowly die like they don't ride off into the sunset they don't have you know that moment um whereas fernando alonso's end game here is just end game isn't there a taylor swift song um uh, his his the end of his career has has just blossomed it's like he was a flower and then the flower started to create a fruit we didn't know about it's like keep growing fernando keep giving us these beautiful beautiful fruits what am i talking about wow i'm just so happy for both yeah me too uh speaking of drivers doing weird stuff um autosport has a journalistic article about valtteri botas making gin gin Uh, yeah drivers seem to do this a lot they make alcohol they make drinks uh i actually really enjoy this article it's kind of like what what does valtteri botas do to unwind apparently he's really into this um and cool. I'm just going to read a, a quote here from Valtteri Bottas from the article. <clears throat> we teamed up with a couple of people from Blue Coast Brewery, a beer from You're Nice. You're kidding me. Yes. <laughs> oh, my God. This is the Daniel Ricardo beer that you had sent to. You got to do it again. A, there's a video yep. on the internet of us tasting this beer. That's insane. It is indeed. Um, it's uh, made from Finnish water, apparently, the gin, uh, which I guess is very pure. And oats from Botas's family farm, which oh. has been in the family for generations. Like I said, this is a very wholesome article. I will link to okay. it in the show notes. Okay. Uh, the gin is called Oath. Par- Oath. Partially, I think, because it's made from oats, um, which is apparently rare in gin. Uh, and it means they have to use a special Brother. vacuum distilling process. Oh, of course. Uh, but yeah, they, are, they it's only made in Europe currently. Uh, they uh, intend to expand first to Australia, where his partner Tiffany Cromwell is from. Um, seems like a very much a, uh, a, a hand-in-hand endeavor with the both of them. Cool. Uh, and then to the U.S. and the U.K. So uh, we have a new goal. I am going to Europe in two days. <gasps> oh, so my God. If they, Holy shit. If they sell, I will look around Ireland. I Wait, will, are you going to be on the mainland? No, I'm only going to be in Ireland the whole time. I bet you they haven't gotten it to Ireland, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, you're probably right. They'll probably get it to that prison island before us. <laughs> no, you're still in the EU. <laughs> no, I meant, the, I meant Australia, not the UK. <laughs> well, well, that's, I was like, that. you must mean England. <laughs> plenty, of, <laughs> plenty of prison islands to go around. Um, no, uh, they so did say on. it's in Europe, so they, you, they might, it might be there. It might, might be. Uh, it, I mean, I have a car. If I, if I have to go somewhere weird in Dublin to get it, I will, I will do just that. Um, they, they only made thirty three thousand bottles, so it's not, not a great sign. Let me, let me. I'm, I'm on their website. Let me see. All right. No, hang on. They said they, in the first year they sold thirty three thousand. 
bottles. Oh, okay. So that's that's, that's, not, a decent so that's start not a sell for through. A that's new a... thing to market. Okay. Yeah. So like the oh wow the initial batch was fourteen hundred seventy seven bottles. Botas's race number uh, oh. was the deciding factor. Um, but. Wow, like I, you know, I I would buy a Valtteri uh, Botas gin, absolutely. Like, gin I, apparently I love is to... pretty popular. It's it's getting I it's love getting more and more popular. Him, Ryan Reynolds, like mm-hmm. everybody's everybody's making gin now, and you can just imagine like, you know, Valtteri walking the floor of his distillery, fully nude. Mm. Mustache, just like nude except for the enjoying, mustache. Yeah, mullet flowing behind him. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm going to have to wow. further Best. research required. I wonder if I can even get some shipped over maybe or something to Ireland if that's doable. Yeah. Hmm. Well, Best of luck with that Thank endeavor, you. Valtteri. Uh, final bit oh. of news here, <laughs> um, which I guess coincides a bit with uh, Race Around the World. We got a new racing series to add to the calendar uh, this weekend. And so I figured I'd do a little miniature primer while we're in Ooh. kind of a primer mood this month. Uh, the F1 yeah. Academy kicks off this weekend. Uh, F1 Academy is F1's response to W Series, a racing series for female drivers that's meant to be a stepping stone into the Formula One ladder, um, in particular from uh, uh, entering into Formula Three. Uh, that's, the, that's the idea. You would graduate from F1 Academy to Formula Three. Uh, the season kicks off in Australia, or I'm sorry, Austria this weekend, uh, the first of seven rounds. There are three races each. Uh, the season is not aligned with the F1 calendar this year, although they mm. do overlap in one race, I think, in Circuit of the Americas. Next year, though, they will be racing with F1 um, at each round. Uh, well, at their rounds, not with, you know, 23 races. Right. Um, okay, so drivers and teams. There's 15 drivers, three per team. If you've watched any Formula 2, you might be familiar with some of the teams. Campos, Prima, uh, Roden Carlin, ART, uh, and MP Motorsport. Uh, and if you watch any W series, you might recall the drivers, Abby Pulling. She's also a member of the Alpine Driver Academy. Uh, Nerea Marti, Marta Garcia, Bianca Mustamante, and Megan Gilks. Uh, other notables are Lena Bueller, member of the Sauber Academy. The sisters, Amna and Hamna al Kwabaisi, Chloe Chong, the youngest driver in the field at 16. And Whoa. Susie Wolf is the managing director of F1 Academy. Uh, she's the former CEO and team principal of the Ventura, Venturi Formula E team. Uh, also the founder of the Dare to be Different initiative, which is a grassroots effort to get women into racing. Uh, she's also married to Mercedes team principal Toto Wolf. Uh, as for the cars, all the same. Um, it's a Tatus T421, which is a Formula 4 car. Um, so as we mentioned in our IndyCar primer, it'll then be up to the driver and the team working together to extract the most out of uh, their cars. Uh, for all you gearheads out there, that is a four-cylinder turbo 1.4 liter, 174 horsepower engine uh, capable of 550 RPM. Six gear longitudinal gearbox with electric paddle shifting. Pirelli tires, zero to 60 in 3.6 seconds and a top speed of 150 miles an hour. They have already done two test sessions at uh, Barcelona, Catalonia and Paul Ricard in France. Um, the drivers who impressed there were Abby Pulling, Marta Garcia and Hamna al Oh, I, I'm going to have a hard time with this one. Al Quabaisi. Uh, the race format, a lot of format talk this episode. Um, two free <laughs> practice sessions and then two qualifying sessions, which set the grid for races one and three, uh, which are both at 30 minutes. Uh, the race two is shorter at 20 minutes, and it's the grid for that is set by the reverse of the top eight yeah. finishers in race one. So if you finish in eighth place in race one, you start first in eight, uh, race two. Which is how they do F2? Formula two. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, race two is awarded fewer points uh, for the top eight only, but race one and three are awarded full points. Uh, there's two points for each pole position because there's two qualifyings. Um, and one point for the fastest lap per race provided the drivers in the top 10. So... Uh, that's kind of your broad overview. We don't know a whole lot about it because there hasn't been a race yet. Unfortunately, there is also no word on how to watch this. Um, it's uh, possible that they're yeah. not filming for cost reasons. 
which one would assume would be alleviated by them pairing with F1 for race weekends next year. Um, mm. I, or they haven't signed, you know, television deals yet. That's kind of what I'm hoping for. Maybe you'll see like, if you're in the UK, it'll be on this channel, but if you're not, it'll be on Twitch or whatever, like kind of how W series did it. Um, but don't know. I hope there's at least some video coverage. So be on the lookout. Yeah. It would be a shame that. considering how, like considering how many, so many of the smaller, like you can watch like a local racing thing and they have at least some, you know, yeah. you, you don't have to have cameras on every single car. Like W series was rough first season, right? Like, but at least they were doing it. You know what I mean? And they, they had great commentators involved as well. Um, they yeah, tried their I mean, best. You could, right? All you it need is commentators. Like, like considering the, you know, so much of this, uh, you know, is about exposure. Like even in F1, like Sergio Perez has a seat because he's a Mexican racing driver who is able to get sponsors and and be, uh, uh, you know, in in the biggest race league in the world and represent his country. Pastor Maldonado, you know what I mean? Like it, this is part of it. So it'd be a real shame if they can't get um, some sort of uh, you know visibility on the actual races and the drivers themselves. Yeah. Well, uh, we uh, will be on the lookout. That does remind me, uh, like this just, I, I meant to add this to the news, but it's relevant related to this. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a, like, the Telegraph first reported this, like, this is as of, like, today. Um, it's, it's not quite blown from a full-blown scandal yet, but uh, Mohammed Ben uh, Salam, the president of the FAA, is under fire, uh, under allegations that uh, Shayla Ann Rao, uh, who was interim secretary, secretary general for motorsport last year, left the company, mm. uh, left FIA, uh, in December. And as sort of an, either this was the reason she was leaving or it was the, uh, or, or it was like just sort of an exit interview, uh, type, type thing, like sent a letter to, uh, Ben Salam's office like stating concerns about sexism in the FIA mm. and like a lack of interest in handling it or investigating it or disciplining people over it. Kelsey Breeze. Yeah. And so like right now it's, it hasn't really gone anywhere. Uh, obviously like this is just coming out today. Uh, you know, the FIA's response is, you know, we're not basically we're not going to comment on what unfolded as an employee was was leaving uh and and various other boilerplate but it it does sort of it it does sort of seem uh like this one like there are people in the organization who have concerns about his leadership and particularly on this on this issue uh so you know when we're talking about you know uh gender representation motorsport it you know this story coming out uh, you know, certainly indicates like it's certainly one reason why the FIA why he might want to get behind something like uh, the Academy more more aggressively, but also might explain why there's a little bit less interest in promoting it effectively or supporting it. Um, so that's just like uh, guard, guard the Guardian just ran a piece today, uh, like anonymous sourcing on it, but people in the F1 paddock were saying that like. This plus, you know, the the misfire over the politics stuff uh, earlier on, like this guy has not had a win in his tenure, right? And it's yeah. just been like he's just stepping on rake after mm-hmm. rake. Um, mm-hmm. So this feel it, it certainly feels like he is going to be an incredibly short lived FIA president as this you know keeps up. We've already seen sort of seen it announced that he would be stepping back. Yeah, from he's already been siloed, right? It's like yeah, yeah. So maybe all right, his days are numbered. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll watch that one as well. Uh, but let's now take it to the track walk, Danny. Where are we going this weekend? Baku in Azerbaijan, uh, which came to us in 2016. Uh, originally, it was the European Grand Prix, if I remember correctly. Um, uh, Baku is a a state on the Caspian Sea. Have you been to Azerbaijan? You've been to a lot of places around there, Drew. I've not. You've never been to Azerbaijan. No. Uh, have you ever been to anywhere near the Caspian Sea before? 
Uh, no. No, I know you've been to, where is it, Kazakhstan? Or where did you, you went to Mongolia, didn't you, to, to do that? I did, yeah, yes. Yeah, good time. Crimea. Um, I guess Crimea? that's the closest. Yeah, probably, actually. Yeah. Um, but yeah, part of the world I'm not particularly um, uh, familiar with, to be honest, but Baku has always interested me um, because it's, I don't know, I think it's one of those examples of put a racetrack somewhere. I know you had the question last week of, you know, where would you like to see, uh, a race being put on and look it's a petro state so there's that but genuinely i could not tell you anything else about baku or azerbaijan except for this uh, uh racetrack so i guess it's done you know done some work to put the uh put the notoriety i guess on the on the on the place um the track itself has been uh, uh it, this has been a fun weekend for a long time um even races that seemed like they were going to be boring like 2021 uh we had max verstappen crashing out and then that crazy restart with lewis hamilton uh where his brakes were cold or he hit the wrong button or whatever um we've had roman grosjean crashing under a safety car we've had vettel and hamilton having road rage <laughs> behind a safety car um Gosh, that's right it's 51 laps long six kilometer uh lap it's 3.7 miles and it has an incredibly long straight and then a very technical uh, third sector. Um, sorry, second sector. Uh, there's lots of places where you can hit a wall. There's lots of areas where you can break too late and go into a little runoff area and have to turn around. Uh, we had that happen a lot in uh, on turn two and turn three, uh, which is the end of the uh, second, or sorry, the first um uh, DRS zone. Uh, the second is on the start finish straight, just as you're crossing the the finish line. Um, and yeah, it's always thrown up interesting races. Expect a lot of virtual safety cars, probably safety cars, uh, lots of yellow flags, um, double waved yellows for a while while cars are trying to turn around or get out of um, uh, runoff areas. Um, and it looks fantastic too. It has this wonderful sweeping sector, a sweeping section in sector two where. They drive uphill against a uh, close to a castle. Uh, Charles Leclerc dancing a little bit too close to the castle uh, during one moment um, a couple of years back. Um, I also remember there being an issue with wind here, uh, that there is some wind coming off the uh, Caspian Sea next door and that that causing havoc with the cars. I remember a lot of shots of flags during qualifying, so I wonder if we'll see some of that as well. Um, but hopefully they have all the manhole covers uh, <laughs> bolted down this <laughs> year because right. everything's happened here. You know what I mean? We had the crazy coming together of Max and uh, Danny Ricardo here as well. It's constantly a source of just weirdness. So the fact that we're doing a sprint race weekend here as well also makes me very, very excited. Yeah, I think it's... I think there's going to be... Well, I don't want to jinx it, but... There's potential for a lot of chaos here. Yes. Especially because it looks like we might have some high winds coming off the sea uh, on Friday, qualifying day. Uh, <laughs> the first qualifying Dear day. Dear Lord. Um, <laughs> might be up to 17 miles an hour or uh, 27 kilometers an hour. Uh, low chance precipitation, only 5%. Uh, but temperatures in the high 80s mm. uh, or around 20 Celsius. Uh, that's... The first qualifying day, the second qualifying day, Saturday, where we got the sprint stuff happening. Um, also, let's see, not as high of winds um, and a little warmer in temps. Uh, we're looking at mid 70s uh, or low 20s Celsius. Um, same for race day on Sunday. Uh, and uh, wind, different direction, actually. Um, but also around 14 miles an hour mm. uh, or uh, 23 kilometers an they hour. They won't like that. So, they won't like that. They hate when it changes direction. Yes, indeed they do. Um, all right. Well, that's the weather. Uh, let's jump into the standings here real quick as we head into the Baku round. Max Verstappen is on top. Boy, I haven't said these names in a while. It feels like we have not <laughs> watched a race in some time. Uh, Formula One race, that is. I'm really enjoying IndyCar. Uh, Max Verstappen on top with 69 points. Sergio Perez right behind him with 54. That's closer mm. than I remember. 
Uh, Fernando Alonso is in third place with 45 points. Lewis Hamilton in fourth with 38. Carlos Sainz and Lance Stroll are tied with 20. Then George Russell in seventh with 18 points. Then a big gap down to Lando Norris in eighth with eight points. Nico Hulkenberg and Charles Leclerc are tied for ninth with six. And then a four-way tie with four points between Valtteri Bottas, Esteban Ocon, Oscar Piastri, and Pierre Gasly. Joe Gonwin Yu's in 15th place with two points. And then we've got Yuki Tsunoda, Kevin Magnussen, Alex Albon with one. And then Logan Sargent and Nick DeVries with zero. Zilch. In the constructor standings, Rebel Racing is on top with 123 points to Aston Martin's 65. That's right. They're in second place. Mercedes is in third with 56. Ferrari is in fourth with 26 points. McLaren's in fifth with 12. Uh, that seems surprising to me. Um, Alpine <laughs> yeah. is in sixth with uh, eight. Uh, Gene Haas and team have seven. Alfa Romeo's got six. And then Alfa Tauri and Williams are tied to the back with one. Uh, if you'd like to join the standings yourself, you can join our fantasy league using the link in the show notes. And you can also send us an email, Danny. You can. You can send us an email at shiftf1podcast.gmail.com or f1.cool slash emails. Uh, Drew, do you want to take this first one from Sarah in Austin? Yes, I will. Sarah in Austin writes, love your podcast. Hmm. Thank you, Sarah. Love your city. That's it. It's the whole email. <laughs> um uh, Sarah continues. I recently enjoyed listening to your idea about having a reverse grid where the <laughs> where only the drivers reverse, not the cars. It's a hilarious proposition that, of course, would never actually happen, but it made me want to ask you what you think of my idea. Mm. Recently, I've heard that Domenicali is talking about having upwards of twenty six or even thirty races in a year in the future. Of course. We know that there are huge logistical, environmental, and cost ramifications, but those aside for a minute. What about having 30 races, but the teams have to put their backup driver or a rookie from their junior program in one of the cars for 10 races a year? I feel like this would allow for some interesting competition between the backup drivers and the number two driver, thinking of you, Ricardo slash Checo. It would also potentially give junior drivers a chance to gain super license points. What do you think? That's a, it's an interesting idea, the idea that maybe the car is, like the number of the car is the competitor and you can pull drivers off the bench. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you don't have- Like a, Indy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't have a, like a bench, right? You can't, Ricardo can't, you know, fight to get his place back off Checo on a week by week basis, but I do <laughs> like, like that uh, idea. You like know? the Premier League? Totally, yeah, yeah, like a like a striker being brought on for the last ten minutes and scoring a goal and and getting to start the next game. My inherent conservatism was initially like this idea sucks. Now this ain't a thing, and then immediately I started thinking this might be a thing because <laughs> if you don't mandate when the rotations happen, oh yes, you have a team politics. That's cool. Like kerfuffle over who gets to start what races. And so you could have a thing where it's like, are they? Hey, is Red Bull burying Chaco because they know he's good at this race to make room for Max? Yeah, is the fix in? <laughs> it's a street race. Chaco is good. You know, get him in there. Right, right. Like there would be like the and and conversely, there would be an interesting element of like team strategizing where hey, turns out you can't run Max or Lewis for all thirty races. So like. Which are the ones you don't send your best? Yeah, mm. yeah. And do you get the thing where you know the the first string quarterback gets hurt, and then the, the second one outshines him, and then you're like, well, maybe we go with you next year. Or other drivers who are in like you know cost you know points fighting positions lower in the grid, then start you know counter programming the top teams by having their best drivers go when their top teams have yeah. their rookies in you know what i mean <laughs> like what if it's yeah. like what wait here we go uh you you have to pick in like a uh dota style uh draft <laughs> right, right? Yeah. so like maybe oh the first God. uh team in the first place in the championship has to <laughs> pick their driver first and then everyone goes down from there yeah how yeah. do we get how do we get bands Counter into band. F one like but <laughs> yeah. like a fun yeah. version of yeah. bands in F one. Everyone just bans Max every time every right. time they try and ban Max every time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's oh, that's good. That's interesting. I like that. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Uh Rob, you're next up. Uh this question from Andrew. Yeah. Andrew writes 
Hey guys, do gearboxes or power units smashed up in crashes count towards their respective team limits for replacing them? For example, I know Mick Schumacher crashing a bunch last year was expensive for Haas, but I don't think they got grid penalties quicker than anyone else for replacing components. Is there an exception in place if you absolutely total your car on track, or is it just that F1 mechanics are good enough that a power unit or gearbox mauled by 200 mile an hour crash is, com is completely within their ability to repair? Thanks again, Andrew. Uh... The rule is the rule, which does seem unfair, but that is how F1 works. Uh, here is your allotment. What happened to those? What happened to the engine, the gearbox, etc.? We don't care. You get three in this this year four, but does not matter what misfortune befell you. The allotment is the allotment. Now, a lot of times there's a whole variety of crashes where large amounts of the powertrain are salvageable. The thing that tends to get broken the most is the gearbox because uh, like, especially with uh, what are called like tank slappers, right? Where you got the car sort of spinning sideways into the wall. Uh, you have a, 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 like a lateral impact on the car that can send like bits of the axle into bits of the powertrain, especially at the gearbox. And so that can that that can cause the uh, gearbox to be destroyed. That is probably the biggest worry when it comes to a uh, you know an accident. Like obviously, yeah, a, a total like a car being totaled. Uh, you know where you got the engine breaking off from the tail. That's going to be a full write off. But um, yeah, like by, by and large, you just have to eat that. Uh, they don't they they don't give you special allotments because like bad things happened. Yeah, it done. rough business. Yeah. Um, next one I'm going to take from Nick and Sydney. Uh, you guys prepared this email, so I've not read this, and it's quite a long yeah, one. Yeah, I so realized after I threw it to you, Danny, I should have thrown it to Rob, because Rob, it's, yeah. it's a bit of a yarn, though, and I wanted to hear Danny tell us. Okay, okay, okay. yeah. I said I'd, just, I'd pick the ball. I'd pick the ball and run with it. I appreciate you throwing it to me, Drew. Um, this one comes in from Nick and Sydney. <laughs> Rob's talk about the old fly-by-night sanctioned slash unsanctioned F1 races reminded me of a guy my mum dated in the late 2000s slash early 2010s. He was a real type of guy who ran a petrol station here in Sydney and also made money importing, restoring, and selling Mopars. Yes, specifically from the States. He always claimed to have driven in an F1 race and had this wild story of Nicky Lauda running over his front wing. Okay. I was dubious until one day I was at his house and he showed me a kinked tire marked bright orange front wing with a message board to him sharpied onto it with Lauda's signature. His racing pedigree was doubly confirmed when, while visiting the garage attached to his petrol station, he dramatically pulled a cloth back to reveal a bright orange open wheeler. Rob's oh, story wow. brought this all back and I wanted to see just how much he'd been flexing the truth. Uh... Uh, truth, uh, he was certainly one for tall tales. Turns out he was sort of right. In the 1984 <laughs> Grand Prix, and there's a link to it here um, from Wikipedia, was the not Australian Grand Prix. Sorry, Australian Grand Prix was not a Formula One race. The Australian Grand Prix joined the F1 Championship a year later in 1985. However, Nicky Lauda was in the race and his crash with one Terry Ryan is listed in the Wikipedia article for the race. Some highlights from the article include, this is quoted from Wikipedia, the trend of the race organizer, organizer Bob Jane of importing overseas star racers, mostly Formula One drivers, continued. The starters for the 1984 race included uh, 1985, sorry, 1975, 1977, and 1984 F1 World Champion Nicky Lauda, 1982 F1 World Champion Keke Rosberg, as well as Formula One drivers Andrea De Cesaris and Francois. I don't know, actually, Francois Hesnault. I don't think I know that person. Hesno? Yeah. Hesno, yeah. Uh, both keen aviators, Lauda and Rosberg, had actually spent most of practicing and qualifying attending an air show at the nearby <laughs> Essendon Airport. Oh, that's so pure. Uh, with newly crowned world champion Lauda stating that he was in Australia mostly for a holiday and just to get away from Europe. Rosberg and Terry Ryan clashed when Ryan was being lapped. With oh, the superb. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> What a twist. What a fucking, what a sick end of the second act twist. 
with the closely following Lauda also colliding with Ryan. Uh, <laughs> he, took, he took out both of them. Amazing. The result being that Rosberg and Ryan uh, were able to continue while Lauda was out. So while my mom's ex-boyfriend did not in fact race in Formula 1, he did compete in an open wheel race with two F1 world champions and managed to run into both of them. <laughs> <laughs> Love the pod. Hearing the opening always brings a smile to my face. Cheers, Nick from Sydney, Australia. Oh, That's wow. Amazing. What a story. What a story. This feels like a guy you'd have such <laughs> emotions about dating your mom. Yeah. What a... That's a... Oh, God. I can't believe he hit them both. <laughs> that's amazing. That's well, and I love that, like... <laughs> that it's not really... A, it's not like a legit Australian Grand Prix. It's just an organizer, like, paying F1 people to show up to this race. Car- Carney stuff, man. Yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> and they call this the Australian Grand Prix. So I guess they, you know, they didn't, yeah. they weren't, it wasn't Formula One, but it was called the Australian Grand Prix. Um, the race was won by Roberto Marino, uh, according oh, oh. to this. Um, John Bow in uh, second and Alfredo Costanzo, the two Aus- Australians. Marino in ended up having a good F- uh, IndyCar career. Yeah. Um, Andrea de Cesaris was in eighth. Francois Hesno, as you said, uh, as was in fifth. KK Rosberg in fourth. So unlucky to. Uh, what was the guy's name again? Terry Ryan. Did he finish? Fifteenth. Fifteenth. Uh, <laughs> ahead of Nicky Lauda. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's one way to do it. He beat Nicky beat Lauda. Yep. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, I was looking at qualifying. Sorry. Yeah. Moreno also won the race, though. You're right. And KK Rosberg came right. second, and the Cesars came third. Okay. Sorry. That makes more sense. Okay. Because presumably Nick Lauda came 18th because he was at that air show. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Amazing. Good stuff. Awesome. Yes, please Thanks, uh, continue to send in emails. Shift F1 podcast at gmail.com or f1.cool slash emails. You can also hit us up on Twitter using the link in the show notes. That's us around the internet. Should we take it around the world, Danny? Let's race around the way. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah. As previously mentioned, the F1 Academy is racing Thursday and Friday at the Red Bull Ring in Austria. We've got MotoGP at the Circuito de Jerez for the Jerez Sprint and Race. Uh, uh, We've got Formula 2 joining Formula 1 in Baku. The World Endurance Championship is at Spa for the Total Energies Six Hours of Spa Francochamps. That's a lot of Spa. It's a lot of weather going to happen there in six hours. Uh, the Xfinity Series, NASCAR Xfinity Series, is in Dover, Delaware at the Dover Motor Speedway for the A-Game 200. Bring your A-Game. Uh, Repco Supercars. Supercars are in Perth uh, at, uh, where is this? The <laughs> the Wanneroo Raceway. Wanneroo Raceway, mate. Wanneroo Raceway. <laughs> Bring your titties. Uh, motocross. <laughs> Motocross Grand Prix <laughs> is in um, Aguenda, Portugal, for the Motocross Grand Prix of Portugal. Nice. IndyCar is at Barber Motorsports Park for the Indy Grand Prix of Alabama. Bama. And we got NASCAR. Now, where are we at? We're in Bama. We're in Dover, Delaware. We are in Dover. De- Look, I'm in Delaware. Delaware, are you? De- well, Del- I'm at the. I'm at the. V- Verth. 400 the v- 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 I, c- I can't tell whether to pronounce the v the w as a v because there's a new loud over the u oh it's a, that's not very american <laughs> no it sure isn't i guess unless you're one of those i thought we beat those germans right if you're a right winger i guess it is umlauts are coming back for them folks too too dark <laughs> what's it called the verst like like a like a sausage Worth w u umlaut r t h Verf. 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 Verf is a worldwide group. Wholesaler of fasteners, screws, and screw accessories. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> propane and propane accessories. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Formula One is also this weekend. Maybe you heard of it. Friday, April 28th, is Free Practice One. <laughs> is it? <laughs> <laughs> At 5.30 a.m. Eastern Time on ESPN2. Followed by Qualifying. At 9 a.m. Eastern Time on ESPN, you see the 
ESPN doesn't know what to do with this. No, they're schedule. not sure. They got, exactly. They got qualifying on ESPN U that no one has. Uh, Saturday, April 29th is the shootout, 5.30 a.m. Eastern Time on ESPN2, followed by the Sprint at 9.30 on ESPN. See, they're, they're giving top billing to the Sprint. I knew ESPN was in the pockets of Formula One. Uh, Sunday, April 30th, though, is the race. Everyone's favorite. Uh, everyone knows it. It's the race, 7 a.m. on ESPN. Terrific. Uh, but that's not the only thing coming up on the calendar. What's on? What's today's calendar entry, Danny? April 26th on my beautiful Formula One on this day says, In 1998, the McLaren Mercedes was the, cl- was the class of the field, but Mika Hakkinen made the most of it, winning the championship and taking eight race victories. By contrast, David Coulthard won just one race, the San Marino Grand Prix at Imola, on this day. Having snatched a rare pole position away from Hakkinen, Coulthard made a good start and raced off into the distance while Hakkinen was forced to retire with a gearbox failure. Ferrari were well beaten on their home turf, but Schumacher and Irvine did provide some consolation for the Tifosi by finishing second and third, respectively. Just kind of a... This one was kind of a... Here's a, ra- here's a race <laughs> Here's results. a race. Here's a race that happened in Imola, <laughs> and here's what happened. Coulthard did a good job for one time. And the Ferraris <laughs> came in second and third. Good old. Eddie you know, Irvine. sometimes it's just it's just fun taking a little slice of history. You know, yeah, uh, it's, the it's uh, nice. I, I work uh, right next to the Video Game History Foundation, oh, and yes. they uh, they have a if you sign up, um, if you subscribe to them, they will mail you a random um, video game magazine of antiquity. You don't know oh, what shit, year what or month they're gonna wow. get you. Uh, that you're amazing. gonna get, and it's it's awesome. Little you get, wait, do you get the physical magazine? Yeah, they send you the magazine. Wow, have they scanned the it themselves before? I guess or something. Yes, it's amazing. Good old yeah. Frank Cifaldi. I, I yeah, walked down work. there and uh, saw Frank Cifaldi signing certificates of authenticity uh, just the other day. <laughs> Terrific. Yeah, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Why not? Yeah, why not? Support our our fr- our friends over here. We love history. Whether it's Formula One or video games, Danny, final That's thoughts. That's all I care about. That's all I care about. Formula One or video games. That's it. I, I uh, mean, my, no more passions. Don't have time for them. Senior creative output. Yeah, that's it. That's all I got, brother. That's it. <laughs> I'm uh, excited for Baku. It should be fun. I'm going to yeah. be in Ireland uh, next week, so I'll be on the podcast uh, reporting live from the Emerald Isle. Um, I'm excited to watch the European Grand Prix, watch the Azerbaijani Grand Prix uh, at a reasonable time as well. It should be fun, and maybe I'll get some get some mates around for it so yeah should be fun hopefully it'll, i'm just it's gonna be a fun interesting weekend regardless because of this whole sprint qualifying one malarkey yes yes indeed maybe you'll be drunk on finished gin i hope uh, so i can hope that's all i can dream for uh final thoughts rob it annoys me that i am torn between my desire to see a weekend packed with good racing and my desire to be right <laughs> like mm. I'm on record. I think this I think the sprint racing stuff sounds pretty silly. Win, I hate win, the concept win, win. here. Win win, Rob. What, you know what? That's that's very true, Danny. There's is, is no matter what happens, uh I will be rewarded with something. <laughs> Whoever wins, we win. Uh if you'd like to support the show and get access to all of our bonus episodes and the official Shift F1 Discord, you can do so over at patreon.com slash shift F1. Have a good race weekend, everyone. We will see you all next week. Yeah.